All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carl Zellick. I'm excited to uh, be here and uh, appreciate everyone tuning in for this virtual conference. I'm going to be talking about myths, musings, and misconceptions related to uh, wearable assistive uh, uh, back devices. Uh, Carl, Carl, please uh, swap screens. Thank you. Was fighting with uh, Zoom for a moment there. All right, so first I just want to disclose that I have two affiliations. I'm a professor at Vanderbilt and also chief scientific officer at HeroWare. Uh, second, I want to mention how much fun it's been to be a part of this community for the last five years. Uh, there's so much cool technology and innovation going on. Uh, we're in store for a great uh, next five years and I'm excited to uh, continue to help generate uh, knowledge in this space to see how these technologies are to uh, start to get adopted and to collectively uh, push toward what we all strive for, which is uh, more societal impact. So one of the big challenges that I see is related to educating society about exoskeletons. Uh, this is a, a picture of a mythical griffin, so half lion, half eagle. And uh, exoskeletons is an emerging field, so we have some of our own folklore, our own myths. Uh, myths and misconceptions in our field uh, undermine our credibility, and so uh, we all benefit from having technologies that are built on a solid scientific foundation. Today I'm going to focus on back assist exos and uh, talk about myths. So these are unsubstantiated beliefs, musings, uh, thoughtful reflections, and uh, misconceptions, so scientific misunderstandings. Just a little bit about myself. I spent the last 12 years studying biomechanics and wearable assistive technologies, everything from robotic exoskeletons and prostheses to smart clothing, wearables, and passive devices. I got interested in uh, back pain and back assist devices a few years ago. And uh, I largely blame it on my kids for destroying my back from all the lifting and, and hauling of them. And so at Vanderbilt, we've been working for the last few years on creating these uh, low profile, lightweight uh, assistive exos. Uh, it was actually Wericon 2018, which was one of the big turning points for us. We won a fan favorite award in the innovation challenge and the positive feedback we got really accelerated uh, our research in the lab, studying more about the biomechanics of back pain and musculoskeletal loading in the motion analysis lab and, and really trying to understand the science. And it also led to our spin-off company, HeroWare, which we'll be hearing more about shortly. All right, so let's launch into the, the myths. Uh, the first one is that exos are primarily wearable assistance devices. This is something that I believe for most of my career. Uh, it's only been over the last few years that I had a stark realization, which is that I think this is simply wrong for exo, uh, occupational exos. And as tech developers, it actually leads us in the wrong direction. So I'd like you all to imagine yourself uh, uh, in the day of a, a warehouse worker, a case picker. Uh, you're loading and unloading pallets for most of the day. Uh, you may be performing 150 lifts per hour, and each time you physically bend down a lift, it might take about two and a half seconds. If you do the math, what you quickly see is you only spend 10% of your time lifting, even for a very lifting intensive job, and 90% of your time you do other stuff, walking around, standing, hopping in and out of forklifts. And so uh, the primary function of an exoskeleton 90% of the time is just not to get in the way. Um, now we know during this 10% of the time, there are benefits to these exoskeletons. It's, it's throughout the scientific literature. They can offload the back by about 10 to 50%. Uh, they reduce the metabolic cost. In the literature, I see a spread for about six to 18% reductions in metabolic cost. So let's imagine you have a device that offloads your, uh, or reduces your metabolic cost by 15%. That's about 75 watts of metabolic power. And so 10% uh, of the time, you're saving 75 watts. But 90% of the time, you still have to carry around the extra weight from the exoskeleton. So you can go to the literature and find out how much it's going to cost your, your metabolic, uh, what, what metabolic penalty you'll incur by, by carrying extra, every extra kilogram of mass. And you can figure out that the, the prediction from current evidence is that you need an exoskeleton that's 1.7 kilograms or lighter in order to break even across the day. And so what I like about this tangible example is it really highlights the importance of thinking about this other 90%. You can also flip this example around and imagine you have a five kilogram exoskeleton and you've got to carry it around all day long. So to carry the, uh, the mass, that the metabolic penalty, you can back calculate how much it needs to be reducing the metabolic cost of, of lifting in order to offset the cost of carrying it around. So as a reminder, the, the assistance goal uh, for these back assist exos is, is, is often to reduce back strain, not necessarily to reduce the metabolic burden across the entire day. But again, I think this gives a really good perspective and helps refocus on uh, the, the day of the worker, the life of the worker and, and where they need uh, assistance. 
And both from reading the scientific literature and going out and talking to these individuals, observing how they work, uh, their feedback in logistics is, you know, not interfering is, is key. They're pushing, they're pulling, they're uh, climbing, they're hopping in and out of vehicles. For folks we've talked to in construction or utility service, they are uh, climbing in and out of uh, tight spaces and, and working in these physically demanding jobs. And certainly for nurses and other medical professionals who are, are working in close proximity to patients and to medical equipment. And so uh, even though uh, uh, many of us think of exoskeletons as wearable assistive devices, uh, my realization is that, that really first and foremost exoskeletons, uh, their role is to stay the heck out of the way. Secondarily, they're there to assist. And ideally, they're not so heavy that the added mass that they uh, uh, that the added mass negates the assistance that they provide. And so, uh, this, in a nutshell, this is my design philosophy for Exos at Vanderbilt. This is the design philosophy that has been adopted by HeroWare. And if there's a, a secret sauce to, to what we do, uh, it's that we obsess over not interfering and comfort. And then we also assist. Okay, so let's uh, switch gears. Next is um, amusing. Uh, something I just realized uh, recently is that we as a field are really good at proving that springs act like springs. Uh, there's many occupational exoskeletons for the back, the shoulders, and other parts of the body that use springs to assist. We've de been developing these uh, spring-like uh, or, or spring-powered assistive devices at, at Vanderbilt for the last few years using uh, low-profile elastic bands. And one of the questions we all have is, you know, what's the right level of assistance? Um, for passive exos, it, it typically takes the form of what's, what stiffness spring should I put into my device? Um, so we started using uh, robotics as a way to explore this. What's nice about robotics is we have uh, the ability to quickly program the robot to act like any spring or really act like any behavior we want. So we have uh, a person wearing a prototype of the exosuit. We have an experimenter who can uh, increase the stiffness, decrease the stiffness, uh, and we can uh, uh, quickly explore, excuse me, and we can uh, quickly explore how people respond to, to different behaviors, different levels of assistance. So during these experiments, we uh, put muscle activity sensors on people's backs. We cover them so we prevent having motion artifacts from the device moving over top. We have them don an exosuit in our motion analysis lab so we can track forces and motion and uh, muscle activity. And here's what we discovered. So we started doing these tests. This is a plot of back muscle EMG over time. And uh, first we had people do a lifting task with uh, no exosuit. Then we added a little bit of stiffness into the exosuit and then a little more and then a little more and a little more. And at the end, it was kind of simple and obvious. You add a stiffer spring, the device provides more torque, the person's back needs to provide less torque. And so uh, at some point, uh, pretty early on, we basically stopped and say, is, is this as simple as it seems? Are we overthinking this? And I ended up going back to the literature and, and looking across a whole bunch of different devices. And uh, here's what I found. So I looked at passive back assist devices that, that tested lifting. On the y-axis here is the reduction in back muscle EMG during lifting. And on the bottom is just the peak exoskeleton or exosuit torque provided. And the first device I looked at was a, a plaid device, personal lift assist device from about 10 years ago. It's just elastic bands that run from the shoulders over a block on the low back down to the back of the knees. And what was nice is in this paper, Frost 2009, they tested the exact same device. And the only thing they switched was the spring stiffness. And it's exactly what you would expect. If you want more offloading of the back, just put in a stiffer spring. We went back to our own work and we plotted our study from 2018 on the same curve. It seemed to fall along the same line. Uh, Alan Asbeck, who, who just talked, uh, we took a look at uh, data they published on their device and mapped it onto the same work, and it seems to fall along the same trend line. And even for other passive uh, back devices, they're, they're just slightly off this line. So um, the big takeaway here, so, so all of these studies are what is available in literature. They weren't designed to be the exact same studies, so it's different participants in different labs on different devices, uh, lifting slightly different amounts of weight. But the point is that uh, the, the uh, amount of back offloading seems proportional to, to the amount of torque that's provided. So um, for any of these devices, if you, if you want to add uh, more offloading in the back, simply add a stiffer spring. Um, I think everyone's uh, well-intentioned in, in wanting to understand what is the optimal level of assistance. I think we're all well-intentioned in wanting to know or compare different devices across the industry. Uh, but, but we can't escape simple physics. And in general, if we want more assistance, we can add a stiffer spring. Uh, when I look across the scientific literature, when I look at our own experiments, 
uh, it seems to be that uh, it, this might be a relatively uh, a straight, straightforward takeaway. And I take this as good news. I, I think this is liberating. Um, of the devices that are out there, we can easily change stiffness. Many of them already have adjustable stiffness or swappable springs. And so um, I look at this as, as an opportunity to focus our effort and, and talents on tackling some of the other challenges to exoskeleton adoption uh, related to comfort and not interfering. Uh, okay, so moving to the next myth, this is a, a quick one. I think this one uh, may be a surprise to some people. It was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, so we, I, I had already set up this framework. I'd already gone back to the literature and looked at the passive uh, back assist devices. And I was curious, based on the published scientific literature, where do the active, the powered devices fall? Um, since they have motors, I think many people may expect that they can offload the back more than the passive devices. So I grabbed as many studies as I could that, that uh, provided the information on the exoskeleton torque and the, the back muscle offloading. Uh, and here's what I discovered. Um, so this is the current snapshot of what I see across the literature. Uh, I'll admit, I'm not exactly sure why this is the case. Um, I suspect it has a lot to do with the challenge of coordinating uh, robotics uh, uh, in unison with, with the, uh, the user. Um, I also expect that as power devices get better, that, that this uh, uh, red band will, will approach the blue band, will approach the passive devices. It remains unclear to me as to whether it will actually move above. Um, and my interpretation, particularly for the back, is that you know, most of the back offloading benefits are, are really from the, the uh, exoskeleton torque. And torque can come from a power device. It can also come from a passive mechanism. So uh, I should also note here that if you come to my lab, you will find about half of our research on powered robotics, about half of them on passive devices. Uh, I like and appreciate both. I work with both of them. They do have trade-offs. And I just think that we as a field should be uh, clear and fact-based understanding what those, those trade-offs are. Uh, okay, so moving on now to a scientific misconception. Uh, commonly, I, I will uh, uh, look out in news articles and I'll, I'll see stories that have titles like uh, wearable robotics only sh shift stress to other parts of the body or um, uh, even industry articles this is from an ergonomics website that, that say, you know, exoskeletons just redistribute force to other parts of the body. Um, other times I'll have people just ask, you know, hey, how do these exoskeletons work? Are they just taking force from one area and shifting it to another? And there's, uh, there's a really simple answer to this, and it's, it's no. That's not how the laws of physics work. And uh, it, it's just a common misconception, it, and it, it's explained by a, actually a really simple moment balance. We can just walk through it quickly here. Um, so humans are complicated with all their muscles and tendons and nerves, but to understand uh, the majority of the mechanics of, of low back loading, uh, you could really just simplify it down to a, a lever system. And so the fulcrum of the lever is the lumbar spine. Um, sitting on your lumbar spine is your head, arms, and trunk. It's about half a body weight. Uh, you're holding some load, let's say it's 10% of your body weight out in front of you. And the reason that you don't fall on your face is because you contract your back muscles. So this provides a counterbalancing torque, but because it has a much smaller moment arm, the muscles have to generate much larger forces than the carried weight out in front. And you can just do this very simple moment balance. And what you see is there's a body weight of force that goes through the muscles. The muscles are anchored down to the pelvis. So that also feels a body weight of force. And the spine feels the sum of all these forces, which is 1.6 body weights. So then you can apply a, a spring-like uh, exoskeleton. So this is a spring between the trunk and the pelvis. And you can just calculate the same uh, moment balance. And what you find is that the muscle force goes down, the pelvis force goes down, and the spine force goes down. And it doesn't matter if this is a spring or a motor or an actuator, it's the same laws of physics. So the idea is, is you don't need to trade off higher loads one place for another. That's not theoretically the trade-off we're making. Uh, exos do absolutely redirect forces on the body. They change the dynamics, they change the mechanics, but it's not a simple redistribution. You don't have to play this game of one goes up in order for another to go down. Uh, this is true for powered and passive devices and they, they both follow the same uh, laws of physics. And then I'll just end on a very quick one. This is the, uh, the most common misconception that we all hear, which is that exos are expected to weaken workers. Uh, based on what I see in the scientific literature, this is unlikely. Uh, about two months ago, um, Bobby Marinoff from Exoskeleton Report was nice enough to do a Q&A on this, so my thoughts are publicly available. So I'm not gonna cover what's in the Forbes article, but I do wanna encourage people to check out this paper by uh, Edgerton et al, 2002. Uh, uh, 2002. Um, What's really cool is it's a review paper where they looked at a, a bunch of different muscle studies. And on the y-axis is the muscle mass and the x-axis is the daily activation of the muscles. So these are isolated muscles where people activated them at different rates. 
And if you uh, only activate them uh, an hour or two a day, then there's absolutely muscle atrophy. The muscles get smaller. If you act, uh, activate them way too much, you overload the muscles and they also atrophy. But there's this huge band in the middle where muscles maintain their mass. And so the idea is if you have workers that are overloaded and you have an exoskeleton that's reducing loading by 10% or 20% or 30%, you're not gonna jump from overloaded to underloaded. If anything, you're gonna move people back into the safe region. So it's a, a cool study to check out to, to look a little bit more at the, uh, uh, what we know about muscle physiology. Uh, to me, wearable robotics, exoskeletons, exosuits, these are tools that make work easier, but not so easy that muscles atrophy. Uh, this gentleman's uh, using a hand truck to unload uh, his vehicle. Uh, I'm not concerned that, that his muscles are going to atrophy. His job is still hard. Um, so with that, I just want to say I'm, I'm inspired by all the progress that's being made across the exo field. Uh, it's been a thrill to contribute as a scientist, a tech developer, uh, a member of the standards committee, and uh, thank you to WerrickCon for bringing this community uh, together, especially this year. And with that, I'm happy to field any questions. Uh, thank you all. Uh, those are two outstanding presentations. So the first question is going to go to Alan. Um, very interesting talk. What is the motivation of moving away from a carbon spring to a gas spring? Yes, that was primarily for packaging. Uh, just the gas spring has a really high displacement with a pretty small package. And so uh, we just wanted to make everything as small as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the next question, for consumer safety, I think this goes to Carl, but both could answer. For consumer safety, with your assist mechanisms, what, um, when the user is lifting a heavy object and the exoskeleton fails, what types of uh, mechanisms would you, um, how can you um, make sure that the system is still safe? Uh, or the question might be, if a spring, uh, if the spring breaks or something, uh, how can we still ensure that these exoskeletons are safe? Yeah, so I think, I think you have to look at uh, each individual device and, and understand whether it's a power device or passive device is what uh, fail safes are in place. What's nice with, with passive devices is, is uh, you can look at how the springs are designed. You can figure out how much energy they're actually storing up and, and even uh, determine whether uh, any type of, of recoil type of injury uh, could occur. So for the most part, these springs actually aren't bearing that much load, at least not in the, uh, um, the elastic band systems. So they're not gonna recoil back with a whole lot of force, but you really have to go device by device and really do a failure mode analysis to understand what are all the different ways it can fail. And if this thing breaks, what's the consequence? So I think that every, every manufacturer needs to be doing that. Yeah, right, and, and I could do a plug for um, uh, the ASTM F48 is thinking about um, trying to come up with some safety standards where could you do some fatigue testing on some of these spring systems? Uh, another question, Carl, this question goes to you. So the reduction in, in the EMG uh, back muscle, that, that curves that you gave where one you showed um, the passive system and then another curve you showed the active systems. And it said your argument is impacted by the choice of peak EMG versus mean EMG, et cetera. Do you know if, if you were using the same um, EMG, uh, I don't know, I, I would call e e EMG, specifications. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly the right. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. So all of the results that were shown were um, mean EMG reduction. They were not peak. In fact, there were some notable uh, devices somebody might have thought, hey, I know there's an EMG study on the SUDEX. Why wasn't it included? Well, it's because they only reported peak EMG, so I didn't include it on that plot. So yeah, all, all of those were my, were my best attempt to, to compare apples to apples only looking at mean EMG reduction. In some cases, papers didn't provide that information and I actually went back and digitized the time series curve, pulled it onto my own computer and, and calculated it myself. Wow, that's really interesting. Do you have a conference paper on, on that yet? No. Oh, okay. That'd be uh, quite interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, hi, Carl, this is Mohammed. In the concept of designing the in, in, inertial robotic exoskeleton, um, let's see, is the concept of designing internal robotic exoskeletons is the same as the, uh, external models? I'm not sure if I 
follow that question. Let me go to the next one. Carl, is there a limit to how high the carbon spring can be? If the spring is way too high, would the wear, wear, wearer not be able to do a deep squat? So maybe- Yeah, you know, actually for any of these devices, whether it's a spring or a motor, right? You can put either a spring in that's so stiff that somebody can't move, or you could have your motor overpower the person. And um, this is something that from a practical standpoint, if you uh, actually put devices on people and you have uh, swappable springs, you can very quickly just give people springs and let them pick their own. And, and they seem to uh, uh, resonate much better with that. In, in theory, you could run a really complicated study to figure out how stiff you have to make something where somebody's not strong enough to bend with it. But it, it seems like a little bit of a technical overkill on just, you shouldn't give somebody a spring that's so stiff they can't bend with it. Yeah, I, can, I can add to that. So um, I, sh I showed you know, sort of the, the desired torque curve for squat lifting. You can actually make that a lot higher and make it stiffer than them. But then what happens is people use their stomach muscle to work against it. And we, we observe this by putting very light people in a very strong, like we can add more carbon fiber to the first version and make it really stiff. And that may be beneficial in some respects because your stomach muscles do something then, but then the, uh, if you, once you pick up a load, the torque required actually jumps up from those curves, right? And so if you have more assistance from your exoskeleton, you can get more benefit. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, why don't we, we've got a, a minute or two left. Uh, Carl and um, Alan, do you guys want to maybe just do a, a last uh, 30 seconds summary for each one? So, you know, something you might want to just say? Uh, you know, if, if I were to end with something, I, I guess I would end with uh, uh, two ideas. The, the first being that uh, I think it's, it's really important for us as an industry, as, as a, a field, um, we all benefit from building our technologies on a really strong scientific foundation. And so to the degree that we can come together and understand those things and then disseminate those to things to people outside our, our, uh, our industry, that, that's really important because there's just a lot of uh, misunderstandings about what exoskeletons are and uh, uh, what the benefits could be and what the risks may be. Um, the second is, is uh, just that design philosophy I mentioned earlier, which is we've really focused on exoskeletons as an assistive device. And I really think we've gotten it backwards. I think for occupational exoskeletons, the first priority needs to be staying out of the way. And the second uh, priority being assist when you can. Um, let's see. So I guess to just to follow up on that, if people are walking, it adds metabolic cost. If you're standing still, um, actually there's relatively little metabolic cost from adding additional weight up to about 20, 30 pounds. Um, but uh, so, uh, it depends on the application. Uh, a, lot, a lot of these things are very heavily application dependent uh, and that was sort of one of the driving factors between our version one and version two exoskeletons as well. I think there's a place for both. Um, and similarly for the arm exoskeletons I showed, there are lots of different use cases. Some people may want just floating an arm for even industrial applications. Maybe uh, some people would want to float a really heavy object. Um, uh, yeah, so I think the challenges in general with our field will be, how do we make things cheaply? How do we make things uh, that people are want, going to want to wear? And we, we focused a lot on how do we make things that people are going to want to wear also. The soft goods are extremely important. Um, we spend a lot of time on those. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the future as well. Um, thank you. So, Carl, I got one last speaker from, from an ergonomist. It says, um, for Carl, do you have a, a slide or a paper that I can share with ergonomists at my company to explain that shifting is not a fact? I tried to explain to them that in earlier, but it, um, uh, but it didn't work. So I, was, I guess they're wondering if you have a white paper uh, that they could share at their company. Uh, sure, if you shoot me an email, I could definitely send something over. And, and in addition to that, I want to thank and congratulate you on trying. It's, it's, it's really important and it's, it's not always easy. It's not always uh, received right away, but I think uh, if, if we have more people out there being vocal about this and, and being able to explain these topics in a, a, a clear uh, manner that, that we can help to change some of these uh, misconceptions and misperceptions. 
Yeah, I remember two years ago, you had the misconception of if you could put a spring that stretched along your back, people were saying that that can't help because you're kind of compressing the spine, but that spring is giving you a force. So it's quite and they wear the, talk, Carl. But, but then they wear the suit and they, and they realize it, it, uh, it helps quite a bit. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think we're, we're getting to the end of time.